Right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another World Potato Congress webinar. It's great to see so many different people here from all around the world, and I welcome you to this webinar. As you can see in the introductory slide, I would also like you to go onto the website and have a look at the World Potato Congress that's going to be held in Ireland in 2022. It's obviously been moved on by a year due to the global pandemic. But please do that and register for this webinar, the Acha, this conference that's coming up soon. So by way of introduction, I am Jackie van der Vals. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Plant and Soil Sciences at the University of Pretoria. My field of specialization is plant pathology. So based on that, I would like to talk to you today about some of the above and below ground diseases that are threatening sustainable potato production. So I don't think I need to tell this audience, but potatoes basically contain a plethora of diseases. So for a plant pathologist, it's challenging. It means job security, and it means you're never bored. But I cannot focus on all of them, although most of these actually do threaten potato production. So I've chosen to focus on three disease complexes for this webinar. And these are early blight and brown spot, rhizoctonia diseases, and then the soft rot and black leg disease complex. In this talk, I will focus for each of these disease complexes. I'll have a look at the pathogen, the symptoms of the disease complex, touch on the disease cycle and explain why we need to understand certain um, critical parts in the disease complex, and then give some aspects of management for each of these diseases. So I'm going to start with early blight and brown spot. So I think you're all familiar with the early blight pathogen. And this is Alternaria solani. Now Alternaria solani is a rather aggressive pathogen. It's able to infect plants directly, and this is why it makes it a problem. In terms of brown spot, it's caused by the small spot alternaria, predominantly alternaria alternata. It's a weak pathogen, it's a saprophyte, and it normally requires wounds or natural opening for infection. So it's not as aggressive as alternaria solani. The alternaria species group in general, the pathogens, are necrotrophs. In other words, they live off dead plant material. So they secrete cell wall degrading enzymes that kill the host in advance of their invasion of the, path of the host plant, and then they live off this dead plant material. They are also what we call polycyclic pathogens. So they have a number of life cycles through the growing season of the plant. So they produce secondary inoculum. And it's this secondary inoculum that causes the disease epidemics that we see in the field. The alternaria species also undergo asexual reproduction, but despite this asexual reproduction, we still see high levels of genetic diversity in the populations. And this allows them to adapt fast and to develop resistance to different cultivars and to fungicides that we use to control them. The differences between Alternaria solani and Alternaria alternata are minor, but Alternaria solani infects predominantly senescing tissue, so older tissue. Young potato plants have an inherent resistance to Alternaria solani. However, this is not the case with Alternaria alternata. We have noticed that Alternaria alternata is able to infect younger tissues, so there's no inherent resistance in a potato plant to Alternaria alternata. When looking at the symptoms of these two diseases, there are differences. Um, sometimes it's easy to confuse the two diseases, but the clear differences come in predominantly in the concentric rings. So with, uh, with early blight, concentric rings are noted, and these are predominantly due to the, the spores that are produced during alternating day and night temperatures and moisture conditions. So we see dark brown to black necrotic lesions, which can appear on leaves and later on stems as well. 
What we also often notice is a chlorotic halo around the lesions, and this is due to a toxin that the pathogen produces and then secretes into the plant, resulting in um, stopping of photosynthesis, which gives us this chlorotic halo. The lesions can either be really small under unfavorable conditions or under very favorable conditions, which I'll discuss, discuss in a moment, they can coalesce and grow and they um, can often completely cover the entire leaf. We also see dark sunken lesions on tubers. Brown spot, on the other hand, the first characteristic symptom we see is on the underside of leaves. And these are these brown spots that you can see. As the disease progresses, these lesions are seen on the upper surface of leaves and of stems. What we must note is that with brown spot, we see very few to no concentric lesion, uh, rings in the lesions. And this is a characteristic distinguishing factor between brown spot and early blight. Lesions on tubers are very similar. They're also dark sunken lesions on tubers. One needs to also remember that there are a couple of similar symptoms that are produced by biotic factors and some abiotic factors that look a lot like early blight and brown spot. The first of these is a manganese deficiency, which results in brown flecks. And these are normally found along the leaf veins or the outer edges of younger leaves. Tomato-spotted wilt virus also produces lesions very similar to those of Alternaria silvani, but we often find that the lesions are grouped and characteristically infected plants can be found next to healthy plants because the virus is seed-borne. Ozone damage, although not seen that often, can result in similar symptoms, but these are normally intervenal browning, intervenal lesions. So it's not exactly the same as brown spot, but one could confuse it if you're not very familiar with the disease. So let's start looking at the disease cycle. For any pathogen, it's really important that you understand the disease cycle. And if one understands the disease cycle, we know where the critical points are where we can apply management strategies to combat the disease. So I like to start by looking at primary inoculum. Now, the primary inoculum of both Alternaria species is basically conidia or mycelium that overwinters in infected plants every or on seeds, on tubers that are left in the soil, perhaps on alternative hosts. We find that the primary inoculum will survive longest in dry, fallow soil. So it's not good to have a lot of dry, fallow soil um, between potato seasons, because then one might end up with a high um, inoculum concentration. So we see that in general, primary inoculum will survive five to eight months on plant debris in the soil. Sorry, let me just continue on from here. Right, after this primary inoculum has reached the plant and infected the plant, it needs to be disseminated. And this occurs through wind, through water, and even through insects. And both primary and secondary inoculum can be disseminated through wind, water, and insects. If we look at a little bit closer at the germination and the infection of the germination of the spores and infection of the plant, when we look at Alternaria solani particularly, Germinating spores, or let me put it this way, spore germination occurs when there is free water or very high relative humidity. So for example, free water on leaf surface after irrigation or after rainfall or a heavy dew event. And this happens when the temperatures are generally higher than 20 degrees Celsius. Infection by Alternaria solani occurs also when there's free water or high relative humidity in a range from 10 to 35 degrees C, although the optimum is 20 to 30. Infection of leaves occurs, or infection of the plant occurs directly or through wounds or natural openings. And this is for Alternaria solani. The picture for Alternaria alternata is very similar. 
The optimum, however, for spore germination is slightly higher. It's about 25 degrees C. And the optimum temperatures for infection are the same, but infection can occur, can occur at much higher temperatures, up to 40 degrees Celsius, which is why we see a lot more of Alternaria alternata in the very hot summers that we experience in South Africa, for example. The one difference here is that Alternaria alternata, because it is not a very aggressive pathogen, cannot penetrate leaves directly. So it requires on wounds or natural openings for infection. Sporulation um, of the two pathogens occurs anywhere between 5 and 30 degrees C, with an optimum around 20 degrees C. We see most sporulation occurring after heavy rain events or irrigation or dew. So this is when we see a lot of sporulation occurring. And then after that, we see dissemination of new chlamydia. And most of the spores are actually produced when we have alternating wet and dry conditions, particularly if the wet conditions are at night, followed by dry days. So for example, if there's a very heavy dew period at night and then it dries up during the day, we will see a lot of spores being produced and then dissemination of these spores during the day. And that's when we will get um, a lot of epidemic development. So moving on to management of these two diseases. Well, based on the fact that the pathogen does not survive for very long um, without a host, it's a good idea to follow a minimum of a three-year three crop rotation with non-hosts, um, ideally five years or more. One can increase the plant's resistance and also actually combat the disease through the application of various biological products and biological control agents. I'm going to discuss fungicide program on the next slide. What's also important is to ensure optimal water management, and this can be done through irrigation scheduling. So this is to ensure that the plants are never under any water stress. So not water logging in the field and no drought stress. However, in dry land areas, this is obviously impossible to manage, but where irrigation is applied, one should use a scheduling um, system. The optimal plant nutrition to manage the disease is to increase, um, sorry, one, this, the optimal plant nutrition, one should actually not increase nitrogen because this is, sorry, I'm now contradicting myself. Optimal plant nutrition for management of the disease is to increase nitrogen because this keeps the plant in a vegetative state. The same with potassium. Potassium helps with wound healing, which will therefore heal wounds that could be otherwise infection points for alternaria alternata. And um, to decrease um, phosphorus. Good insect and weed control is very important. As I mentioned, insects can spread the inoculum and weeds can be a source of um, infection of um, inoculum. So there could be a reservoir of inoculum throughout the season or in the beginning of the season. If one is following a fungicide program, one must always follow registered spray programs and not deviate from them, not spray too much or too little of the, the fungicide as than what is registered. Normally with brown spot, it is advisable to start spraying earlier in the season than one would for early blight because alternaria alternata can infect younger plants. What's critically important is to alternate ingredients from different frac groups. This lowers the chance of resistance development. And we know that there's a lot of resistance, particularly in alternaria alternata. So if one alternates active ingredients from different frac groups, then it lowers the chance of resistance development. It's also important to combine systemic and fungicides. One must just ensure that it still follows the registered spray program and that the fungicides can actually be combined. Right, now we're going to move on to rhizoctonia diseases. So where I was discussing folio diseases previously, we're now going to move to a pathogen that can infect um, below ground the tubers and slightly above ground the stems. And this is rhizoctonia. 
So Rhizoctonia solani, the causal pathogen of these diseases, is a basidiomite fungus, and it causes disease in numerous plant hosts. So it's rather ubiquitous. It consists of a species complex of 13 what we call anastomosis groups. Now, I'm not going to go into detail as to what an anastomosis group is, but these, what is important to know is these AGs differ, and they differ in terms of their pathogenicity, virulence, the host range, their fungicide sensitivity, and the symptoms caused. So it's really important that one actually knows which AGs are infecting your potatoes and which AGs are most prevalent in a certain area because this will um, result in different control measures that are required to control them. We also need to note that the prevailing climate, the crops in the rotation cycle and certain agronomical practices also affect the presence and the distribution of AGs in the field. So, okay, so now we know that this is important. What more can I tell you about AGs? Well, the most predominant AG in potatoes is AG3PT. The PT actually stands for potato. It's specialized to potato. It does not mean that it cannot infect other crops, but it's really specialized to potato. And when one sees the sclerotia on a potato tuber, it's most likely AG3 that, that has produced those sclerotia. And these sclerotia are the survival structures. So AG3 produces abundant amounts of sclerotia, which then survive in the soil. As I've mentioned, the previous crop, the weather and agronomical practices affect the prevalence of an AG in a soil. So for example, um, if the previous crop was soybean, one is most likely to find a lot of AG4, HG3, because that affects soybeans. Maize, um, for example, you would find a lot of AG223B 2, 2, because this pathogen infects maize. Sugar beet, for example, is infected by AG4 and also AG22. 2, 2. So if you know the previous crop, you can get an idea of what AG you're likely to find in the field. This is also important to know because, for example, these two that I've mentioned previously, can infect, um, can infect potatoes under warmer conditions than AG3PT can. So where we normally associate cold conditions with um, rhizoctonia or the other way around, we need to remember that AG4, HG3 and AG223B can infect potatoes under slightly um, warmer conditions. Already mentioned is that AGs differ in their sensitivity to fungicides. And there are quite a few publications and even lay articles out on which AGs are more sensitive to which fungicides. So if one knows the AG present in a field, then one can tailor make the fungicide um, package to those AGs. Again, they cause some different symptoms and I will briefly discuss this in the next slide. So what I've put up here on the screen are some of the different symptoms associated with rhizoctonia. I'll discuss them in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. But what I want you to see here is that different AGs are linked to different symptoms. So one cannot necessarily assume that all AGs cause the same symptom, or that if you see a certain symptom, it's only AG3PT, for example. Okay, so. Um, it's good to know the literature, the scientific literature, about which AGs cause which symptoms. So the symptoms that we classically associate with rhizoctonia are basically black scurf, as you can see on the left-hand side in, in the yellow circle, or stem and stolon canker on the right-hand side, also circled in yellow. However, there are other symptoms which we also need to remember that can be caused by rhizoctonia. And this, these include aerial tubers. A lot of people already know that aerial tubers are, um, can be caused by rhizoctonia. And then malformation and tuber cracking, elephant hide, corky cracks, these are also all symptoms associated with the infection of potatoes by rhizoctonia. So quite a broad range of symptoms associated with infection of potatoes by this pathogen. So in terms of these specific symptoms, 
Stem and stolon canker normally occur in the beginning of the season. And these are most important in terms of yield losses or loss of vigor, because if the stem or the stolon are infected, then basically this is going to affect the physiology of, a, of the crop and will result in a loss of yield at the end of the day. It can also result in delayed emergence, poor and uneven stands, and sometimes damp, well, often damping off as well. As I've mentioned, we often also see aerial tubers, and this is when we have a very severe stem and stolon infection case. And it's often an indication that there will be very few or no marketable tubers underground. So if the aerial tubers are as a result of rhizoctonia infection, this is a, a worrisome symptom because one needs to then um, really have a look at what the yield is underground. Black scurf, the most common and obvious sign and symptom of rhizoctonia. This often we see at the end of the season and doesn't necessarily cause yield losses, but it would cause a drop in quality of the potatoes or of the seed batches. And then some of the other symptoms that I've mentioned, cracked or malformed tubers, also a drop in quality, um, a little bit of a yield loss as well, and perhaps rejection of seed batches. So I've previously mentioned that AG3PT prefers cool conditions. So if after planting, the conditions are wet and cool, so between 5 and 25 degrees C, if there's a lot of um, soil moisture and high organic matter content, and generally if the pH is less than 7, these conditions are favorable for development of rhizoctonia. So one then needs to be on the lookout for rhizoctonia infection. So going to the disease cycle now to understand where we can combat the disease and how it actually affects the potato plant, I again am going to start by looking at initial inoculum. So the initial inoculum, the primary inoculum sources, are basically contaminated soil and seed. So it's not only soil-borne or seed-borne, the inoculum comes from both sources. There has been a little bit of controversy about which of these sources is more important, but at the end of the day, both soil and seed-borne inoculum is important for different reasons. When we look at symptom development, we see that for black scurf, both soil and seed-borne inoculum are equally important, and this applies root and stolon infection as well. So we cannot really say that either one is more important. However, when we look at the development of stem canker, which also then often leads to the development of the sexual state of rhizoctonia, we see that seed-borne inoculum is more important than soil-borne. So this reminds us that it's very important to plant pathogen-free seed to prevent the introduction of new genotypes into a field. So if we're planting seed that contains rhizoctonia, inoculum, the chances are that we're bringing new genotypes into the field, which will allow for recombination and therefore the chances of resistance developing, resistance to cultivar or resistance to fungicide. So it's critically important to keep the seed that's planted free from rhizoctonia. Looking at management strategies, if we start with planting, as I've already mentioned, pathogen-free seed, and if possible, choose soil that's free from rhizoctonia. Shallow planting, the faster the plant can emerge and then start photosynthesizing and not have to rely on the resources in the seed, the better. And avoid waterlogging in the soil because, as I've mentioned, a high soil moisture is favorable for the development of rhizoctonia. Plant nutrition, it's important to increase phosphorus, sulfur, um, magnesium, and copper because these will give the plant um, some added resistance to the pathogen. One also needs to increase the nitrate supply and decrease the ammonium supply when, when one is applying nitrogen because alkaline soils will suppress the development of rhizoctonia salami. 
In terms of soil and seed treatments, fungicides are not always 100% effective because of the fact that we sit with two different inoculum sources. So one would have to really come in hard with soil and seed treatments, and it's not environmentally friendly or sustainable to do that. This, uh, the other problem is that there is resistance present in the Rhizotonia population to a number of the fungicides that are currently used. There are quite a few effective biological control options that one can investigate, for example, trichoderma. So this is a more sustainable option. It's obviously a long-term solution that one needs to um, follow for a long period of time. It's not a once-off, but it is way more sustainable in terms of preserving soil health. Harvesting early and removing the tubers from the soil is very important as the disease will develop after vine kill and in storage if one doesn't remove the tubers fast enough from the soil. Following hygiene, good hygiene practices is always important for any pathogen, for the, for the management of any disease. So one should infect equipment and stores on a regular, uh, disinfect equipment and stores on a regular basis. And then as with Alternaria species, crop rotation for a minimum of three years is important. And in this case, also with non-hosts such as the grain crops. It's important that one knows again which AGs are present in that specific area and develop region-specific programs to um, suppress the rhizoctonia inoculum in that soil in that area. So just to summarize rhizoctonia, the crop rotation cycle and the environment will influence the presence of AGs in a certain area, and that is important to note. And this again has a knock-on effect on the symptom expression and the fungicide sensitivity. So one needs to package it according to the AGs present in that area. And then the inoculum source, soil or seed, will affect symptom development. Last but certainly not least of these three diseases is the soft rot, black leg and aerial stem rot complex. So this again, is a disease complex, which has various different symptoms, soft rot in the field and after storage, black leg in the field, aerial stem rot and lenticel hard rot are some of, or basically the most important symptoms that, this, that are associated with disease complex. The other one is non-emergence, as you can see in the bottom right-hand photo, and this can cause severe economic losses. In this particular field, only about 30% of the plants emerged due to rotting seed tubers. So that was a, a loss of 70% of the input cost, which, as you will know, is a very severe economic loss. I have highlighted just a few of the important soft rotting pectobacteriaceae, in other words, pathogens that cause this disease complex of potatoes. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are the most important ones found worldwide. Um, these soft rotting bacteria were previously all known as the Erwinia species, or the Erwinia genus. And they were, a couple of years ago, they were split into two genera, Pectobacterium species and Vicia species. And the taxonomy is constantly changing. But at the moment, the most important black leg causing species are Pectobacterium. Pectobacterium atricepticum and Pectobacterium brasiliensis. These two are very virulent, very aggressive pathogens. On the Dickia side, we have Dickia solani and Dickia diacicola, which cause black leg as well. Other species that also um, are part of the soft rotting Pectobacteria causing disease on potatoes are Pectobacterium caratoverum, Pectobacterium parmenterii, uh, Dickia didanti, and Dickia chrysanthemum. As I've said, it's not an exhaustive list. These are the most important pathogens that one needs to be aware of. What's important to know about these pathogens is they are facultative anaerobes. So this means that they flourish at low oxygen and high carbon dioxide levels. So where we have uh, high moisture content on plants or on tubers, this creates an anaerobic condition or a facultative anaerobic condition, which is 
highly favorable for the development and the reproduction of these bacteria. We also need to know that with most bacteria, and these are no exception, they can only penetrate plant tissue through wounds. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. These bacteria, as you saw in the previous slide, have flagella, which allows them to swim. So the structure tells us something about their function and how they operate, and this tells us that they will require moisture to get to their host, free soil moisture. And another important factor is that these bacteria are primarily seaborne. They cannot survive for extended periods in the soil without a host or without surviving on some sort of plant debris. So if we look at conditions based on what I've said, conditions that are favorable for disease development, high soil moisture or soil moisture on or around a plant or a tuber. So for example, if we take seed out of cold storage and we want to transport it to the field where it is going to be produced, we're going to take it out of cold storage. And if it is not warmed up slowly, we're going to get a layer of water around it, condensation. And if there is a certain level of bacteria in that seed, we have condensation around the tuber and the temperatures start rising, we will eventually see rotting of that tuber. In the soil, temperatures above 20 degrees C are favorable for the development of the disease. So relatively warm soil temperatures. Dense plant canopies, because obviously this prevents um, evaporation of water and it keeps the soil moist. Now, although, although that's very favorable for the plant, if we have a big problem with pectobacterium, this is going to exacerbate it. Wounds and other stress conditions. So you can see this picture of seed that has been cut. And obviously this batch was contaminated with pectobacterium or dickia. And the cutting, the, the cutting knives were not disinfected between each batch. And it resulted in a lot of rotting seed tubers. So moving on to the disease cycle, again, we start with the source of primary inoculum. The seed, as I mentioned, is the source of primary inoculum. The pathogen can survive. It can survive in plant debris or infected tubers, but in fallow soil, without any plant debris or without a host, it will not survive for very long. Um, six weeks to three months, depending on the environmental conditions, is um, accepted to be the longest that these pathogens will survive without a host. Okay, so if we have a look now, once the seed is planted in the soil, there are other ways in which the bacteria can also enter the field. So should the bacteria not come in through seed, they could also enter the field through contaminated irrigation water. So it has been shown in a number of studies throughout the world that um, surface water is often contaminated by Pectobacterium and Dickia species, and these are often um, virulent species. So bacteria can enter through irrigation water. They can, the bacteria can be spread through insects, through nematodes in the soil, and by aerosols from neighboring fields. So if a neighboring field has a severe infection of black leg and aerial stem rot, for example, and it's been harvested, then aerosols can spread from that field to contaminate another field. So once the um, seed is planted in the field, if it is latently infected, in other words, one cannot see the infection with the naked eye, it can start rotting if the environmental conditions are favorable. So remember, high soil moisture, high soil temperatures, and this can result in poor emergence. If, however, the plants emerge and they go on to grow, the bacteria can move up through the vascular bundle into the holmes, and this is when we start seeing development of black legs. So once the bacteria start moving up the xylem and they start reproducing and producing what we call cell wall degrading enzymes, they will then create this typical black leg symptom when the plant starts dying. What one needs to remember is that after vine kill and even in the season, if the plant dies off and the tubers in the soil are rotting, the bacteria can move in the soil. Remember, they have flagella, they can swim from one 
um, infected tuber to another one that could be healthy and thus infect that other tuber. They can also infect roots that way if there are any wounds or open lenticels on the tuber. After harvest, rotting tubers in storage can result in infection of other tubers, particularly if um, storage conditions are not optimal, if there is poor ventilation or if the temperature is not low enough to stop the infection. So if we look at management strategies, for example, we start with reduction of contamination of seed tubers. So how does one do that? First of all, use early generation seed. So the lower the generation, the lower the content of bacteria, because each generation, and, and this applies to seed certification systems throughout the world, each higher generation of seed has a higher tolerance for bacteria. So the higher the generation of seed, the higher the tolerance, and therefore the greater the chance of perhaps containing some bacteria in that seed. Harvest early in dry conditions. If one harvests in wet conditions, the chance of the bacteria um, moving from an infected uh, tuber to contaminate some of the other tubers is very good. If one is going to cut seed, which is not ideal because one is going to create a wound, ensure that the cutting equipment is regularly cleaned and disinfected and ensure that the wounds heal. Um, Prof. Gary Seacole gave a very good lecture, a Potato Congress webinar, which is available on the website, on um, reducing contamination of seed tubers by these bacteria. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Please go and listen to Prof. Seacole's webinar. So what can we do to minimize disease spread if it's already present in the field? Well, prevent waterlogging, as with other pathogens. One doesn't want to have any waterlogging in the field. In the case of, of the Pectobacteriaceae, the pathogens will swim from one plant to another. Obviously, do not plant any diseased or damaged tubers. So remove them from the seed batch and don't plant them. The same as with Rhizoctonia, plant when conditions are favorable for rapid growth and rapid emergence of the plant. Particularly in the case of seed crops, one can rogue infected plants. In other words, remove any plants that show symptoms of black leg or wilting. And try not to pulverize the home during wet conditions. So if it's very wet in the field, try not to drive through it too often or walk through it too often because these pulverized plants can release the bacteria from inside the plant, which can then go on to infect other plants. At harvest, it's best to remove the muddy tubers and any rotting tubers at harvest so that these are not harvested and then stored with healthy, with healthy tubers. Looking at some other management strategies not incorporated previously, one should always place tubers at room temperature before transport to prevent condensation around them, and I've explained why. Again, Basic principle for planting potatoes, a minimum of a three-year crop rotation program. So this should always be followed to, to combat any kind of pathogen. If the tubers are washed, and this could be um, for um, sale on the, the wear market or seed tubers, the wash water must be changed regularly and it should be treated with a disinfectant. So change it in between each batch of tubers. It's important to remember that there are no registered chemicals for control of this disease complex. One can apply certain chemicals to prevent the spread of the pathogen from one plant to another in season, but one cannot cure a plant of this disease. So it is best to manage it and to um, prevent infection from the, from the word go. So I'd like to summarize all three of these diseases. And being a plant pathologist, being a lecturer, I always bring it back to the disease pyramid. So no disease can develop if we don't have three, in fact, four factors in place. We have to have an environment that's favorable for development of disease. We have to have a susceptible host and we have to have a virulent or an aggressive pathogen interacting for a long enough period of time that the disease can actually develop. 
So if we want to combat or to manage a disease, we've got to focus on minimizing at least one of these factors. If we can minimize um, all three, or actually all four, then we will not have development of disease at all. So ideally, we want to create an environment that is most favorable for the host, that's the, um, that's the potato crop, and least favorable for development of disease. We want to strengthen the host. So whatever we can do to boost the host's immunity. So whether it be biological applications or ensuring that the nutrition of the plant is optimal, optimal irrigation, best planting time, making sure that the plant is as healthy as possible, that will give the plant an advantage over the pathogen. And then to reduce the amount of pathogen in the field, and I've mentioned some of the strategies that we can use to do that. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. And most importantly, I would like to thank the World Potato Congress sustaining partners. We have three levels of partners here. And um, thank you very much again for this opportunity to chat to you today. So I'm open to answer questions. I see there are quite a lot of questions in the Q&A and um, let me start there. Let me see. Okay, why is reduced um, potassium, oh, sorry, phosphorus nutrition important in the management of alternaria? Thanks, John, for that question. So um, to re why, if one reduces the phosphorus nutrition, it's going to keep the plants in the vegetative state for a little bit longer, and thus it will prolong the period that the plant is inherently resistant to Alternaria solani. Um, okay, uh, there's another question here. Since bacteria are primarily seed born, can you test your seed for the potential for soft rot decay? Yes. One can certainly do that. There are a number of um, PCRs, polymerase chain reaction, and quantitative PCRs that one can use to test. Um, certain countries have different regulations in terms of testing seed before planting, but yes, there is definitely an option for testing seed before planting to determine the level of, of um, bacteria in the seed, yes. Um, the question that I've got next up here, um, are there any uh, resistant or tolerant potato varieties to, um, I'm assuming you're asking black leg. We don't have resistant varieties at the moment. Um, that's a bit of a challenging one. It's rather difficult. There are varieties that are more tolerant to black leg and soft rot, but very few varieties actually show a, a level of full resistance to it. Okay, another question. Will a three-year rotation with cereals take care of Alternaria inoculum in the plant debris in your soil? Not necessarily. It will reduce it. It won't necessarily eliminate the inoculum at all. So um, cereals is a good um, alternative host to plant but it won't necessarily remove all the inoculum in the soil. It will just reduce it. Okay. Um, so I've just got to keep track of. Okay, I've answered that one. Okay, information about the use of calcium to induce resistance to pectobacterium. Yes, that is actually very interesting there. Um, Increased calcium levels do definitely increase the resistance of potatoes to this soft rotting pectobacteria. So calcium is built into the cell walls of the potato, of all plants actually, and strengthening the cell walls will increase their resistance to soft rotting bacteria. So yes, quite a lot of work has been done on this. So an increase in calcium nutrition is, is favorable, definitely. Um, okay. Oh, yes. Um, another comment. Comments regarding the, the part that free living nematodes may have in black leg. Yes. Um, obviously, I couldn't um, put all of this in the 
total. It's um, also known that free living nematodes do definitely disseminate um, the bacteria in the soil. So they, they can transport the bacteria on their mouth parts or even on their um, bodies from one plant to another. So yes, they are involved in dissemination of bacteria in the soil. Um, can any other pathogen cause elephant hide other than rhizoponia? So there have been quite a lot of studies having a look at the causal agents of elephant hide. And the most common causal agents have been shown to be rhizoponia and streptomyces. But in most studies, it's actually been shown that the two work synergistically. So streptomyces on its own won't necessarily, well, it depends on what one classifies as elephant hide. But generally, if you have rhizotonia and streptomyces together, you get a lot of elephant hide. So it's those two species that are responsible for elephant hide. Um, any correlation between, okay, I think I've answered this one, nematode infection, okay. Any correlation between nematode infection and bacterial infection with other tuber diseases? Yes, actually, quite a lot of um, uh, diseases have been shown to have a correlation with nematode infestation. So verticillium, for example, definitely. So the nematodes can either be active or passive vectors of other pathogens. Can rhizotonia develop during a cold storage period? So um, that depends what cold is. Generally, if it's below five, it wouldn't develop five degrees C, it wouldn't develop much. Um, above five, you would probably found, um, you'd probably find that the rhizotonia would continue to develop, albeit very slowly. Um, the question is, if I have malformed potato, should I test for rhizotonia? So rhizotonia is not the only thing that results in malformed potatoes. There are a number of other reasons that your potatoes could be malformed. One of the most common reasons would be herbicide toxicity, for example. Um, some of the cracks that we see are due to growth cracks. So in other words, change in soil um, moisture content, rapid change in soil moisture content can also result in malformed potatoes. So it's not necessarily only due for, to rhizoctonia, but often one would see the sclerotia on the malformed potatoes, or you would see a typical elephant hide as well. And then yes, one would, would want to test for rhizotonia. Um, the name of nematodes that can transport bacteria, well, it's a number of them, but it's basically the group of free living nematodes. So any of the free living nematodes. Uh, sure. Okay, there are quite a few long questions here. Okay, I've got uh, the questions that I'm just making a note here. The questions that um, don't particularly relate to this, I will answer afterwards, or perhaps you guys can send me an email if I didn't answer your question right now. But it's not related to this talk specifically. Okay, which comes first, the nematode issue or black leg? Well, <laughs> maybe that's a chicken and egg question. Um, it could be either. So the nematodes could, could cause wounds that the bacteria then invade via, or it could be that the um, rotting potato secretes certain um, exudates that then attract the nematodes. So I, I, I really, I'm not sure. Um, sure, sorry, I'm trying to keep up with all these questions. Um, okay, is chlorine dioxide effective against soft rot or black leg? So any chlorine product would be because it's a disinfectant. But remember, disinfectants are deactivated by um, organic compounds, so organic matter rather. So yes, it's effective. One can use it. Um, the other question is, um, 
soft rot pathogens in seed crops, is there any difference between physical vine kill, like flailing versus a desiccant on the seed crop infection? I know that a lot of work was done um, at Scottish, at James Hutton Institute. And I honestly now cannot remember what their answer was. If somebody from um, JHI is here, maybe they can give, help me here. I cannot remember. There was a study done on that, but now I've gone blank. Um, is there a, a relationship between black leg bacteria and Fusarium oxysporum in terms of wilting? Um, I'm not sure if there is. There may be. I, I, I don't know. I haven't read anything particularly relating to that. Okay, so the question is, um, Besides verticillium, can nematodes promote infection of other pathogens, for example, Spongospora? I haven't, I do work a lot on Spongospora as well, and I haven't particularly read that it's um, aided by nematodes, although it's not impossible. So I'm not going to discount the role that nematodes would have in spreading pathogens, but I have not read anything particularly re relating to nematodes and Spongospora. Yeah. Okay, some of these others I will answer. You can drop me an email. My email was on the first slide, or you can get it off the website. I will answer them. Here comes some. Okay, so I think we have been going for almost an hour, and um, I know that for some people it's very late at night, for some people it's early in the morning, South Africans, it's just late afternoon. Um, so I would really like to thank you all for attending. I'm really grateful that we had so many participants and I'm, I'm very honored to have been able to present this to you. Please do feel free to um, email me questions if you have any further questions. And I hope that you can join the World Potato Congress in 2022 and also link into some more of their webinars. Thank you, everybody.